Practical Duties of the Christian Sabbath by Bishop Daniel Wilson Ezekiel 20 verse 12 Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. The divine authority and perpetual obligation of a day of holy rest and religious worship have been abundantly proved. Everything conspires to impress us with its supreme importance to man in all ages and under all dispensations. Such is its antiquity that it was instituted in paradise such its essential moral nature that it was inserted in the Ten Commandments. Its dignity is so great that it lifts its head high above the ceremonies of Moses while under that economy. Such is its spirituality that the holy prophets insist upon it as a point of fundamental duty and is about to form a part of the gospel kingdom. Its perpetual force and native majesty are so distinguished that our Lord, after explaining what the comments of the Jewish doctors had obscured, leaves it in more than its original glory, transfers the day of its celebration to that of his resurrection, and erects it into a trophy of his victory. Such, in a word, is its paramount authority upon the human conscience, that the Christian Church in every age, including the apostolical, has confessed its claims and made it the occasion of their delight and joy. It is, in truth, a sign of the covenant between God and man, a badge of our Christian profession, the acknowledgement we publicly make of God who created and the Saviour who redeemed us, a chief means of that dedication and sanctification of man to his almighty Lord, which creation and redemption are designed to produce. And this leads us to the second and practical division of our whole subject. What is the sanctification of this holy day which is enjoined under the gospel? What is the importance of so observing it? What the evils of the opposite neglect? Lastly, what is the necess necessity of personal and national repentance for our violation of it. Grave questions these, and demanding all our attention. For why the accumulated proofs of the institution, stretching from the creation of man to the rest of heaven, but to enforce its practical duties? And what is the true source of almost all the objections to its divine authority, but the dislike which fallen man has to its spiritual worship and holy demands? If the rest of the Sabbath be admitted to be external and civil merely, if the public duties of the worship of God be confined to a brief and cursory service, if the private hours of the day be spent in worldly or intellectual or festive indulgences, all objections to its authority would cease. Such a Sabbath would be allowed. But if we maintain that the great end of the appointment is to be a sign of God's covenant and a means of sanctification, if we maintain the duties of it to extend to all classes of persons and during the whole of the sacred day, 
if we maintain that the spirit in which these are to be performed is the filial temper of joy and delight in God, if we maintain that the mighty blessings which are to be especially commemorated are none other than creation, redemption, heaven, if, in a word, we show that the Sabbath, practically considered, is Christianity embodied, revelation set forth visibly in its simple and majestic features, the sign and representation of the covenant of grace, the means of sanctification exhibited and set before our eyes, then the corrupt reason and perverted affections of man will invent objections to its authority, that they may escape its unwelcome bonds. These then are the very points which in the present discourse we shall endeavour to illustrate. The great end of the institution, its public and private duties, the spirit and temper which it cherishes, the especial blessings which it commemorates. And here let two remarks be premised. We enforce not the duties of the Jewish, but of the Christian Sabbath. The ceremonial and civil appendages of the Mosaic law, the spirit of bondage, the terrors of Mount Sinai are past. It is the gospel in all its grace and loveliness which we maintain, that mild and merciful institution, cleared from the traditionary yoke of the Jewish masters, which our Lord confirmed as the boon and gift originally granted to man. Everything in the Christian Sabbath is tender and considerate on the one hand, Everything is spiritual and elevated on the other, and is, in both views, adapted and suited to the real state and exigencies of our nature, under the last and most perfect dispensation of religion. But then the determination of what is really spiritual, of what is really for the welfare of man, of what are the real duties and employments of the day, must be taken from the scriptures themselves, and not from the opinions, much less from the inclinations and fashions of a corrupt world. We must rise to the standard of the Sabbath as set forth in the Bible, not sink the Bible to the level of our wayward passions. This is the second remark. The doctrine of the institution, like the counsel of a skilful physician, is designed to produce a cure for our moral maladies by wholesome medicines and to foment the disease by cordials or hide its worst symptoms by opiates and palliatives. And do thou, almighty God and Father, who madest the Sabbath for man, assist us to rise up to its true demands. May the Spirit teach us what thy revelation really imports, and what the day which thou callest thine own is designed to become. That, knowing our own misery and receiving with humble faith the redemption of thy Son, we may delight in the services of that season, which is one chief means of communicating the blessings procured to it, procured by it to our souls. In considering then the practical duties of the Lord's Day, we must keep ever in view the great end of the institution which is to be a visible sign of the covenant between God and us, and a principal means of that sanctification which it is one object of that covenant to produce. For it is not merely in the words of the text that this express end is assigned to it. Almost a thousand years before, 
the Lord had declared by Moses, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Thus we learn that this is an essential design of the institution. It received indeed especial sanctions and was connected with particular observances during the continuance of the national covenant with the people of Israel. But as in sanctification, the whole human race are interested, the Sabbath becomes a sign to every nation in every age where revelation with its weekly rest reaches. It is accordingly immediately connected in a passage above cited with the original appointment in paradise. Six days may work be done, but on the seventh is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And so Moses, after receiving the Decalogue and the two commands which form the summary of it, pronounced in another place, Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. The holy day of rest is then to be regarded as the sign, badge or profession of the God whom we serve and of the covenant of his grace of which we profess to be members. We testify our allegiance to the Lord who rose again from the dead through the blood of the everlasting covenant. The Sabbath, interrupting our secular pursuits and calling us off to the spiritual duties of religion is a symbol whereby we declare what God it is we worship, acknowledge that the Lord revealed in the Bible is our God and no other, and proclaim ourselves the vassals and servants of that only God who created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested the seven and commanded us to observe this suitable distribution of time as a badge and livery that we worship him alone. And we keep it under the gospel on the Lord's day to avow our belief that on the morning of that day, the first of the week, redemption, like a second creation, was accomplished. Mortality was swallowed up of life. Our Lord rose from the dead and ceased from his work and rested and was refreshed. And that we are the servants and worshippers of that adorable Saviour. Thus the covenant of grace in Christ Jesus is set forth in our Christian celebration of this festival. We are not Jews but Christians. And wherever the religion of Christ is established, the symbol and cognizance of the resurrection comes with it. And this not for the mere avowal of our allegiance or the manifestation of the attributes and glory of our Creator and Redeemer, but also for the purpose of promoting that sanctification which is the end of the covenant to produce. The expression of the text and of the similar passage just cited is most remarkable. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. What an exalted end and design of the institution. Sanctification is the work of God's Holy Spirit by his secret but effectual influences upon the heart, separating man from the love and service of sin and turning him to God and holiness. The idea is that of setting apart, separating, consecrating for certain holy purposes. Thus, when applied to sacred persons, times, services, garments, buildings, it imports the separation of them from profane uses and the dedication of them to the honour of God. 
so the Sabbath was in paradise sanctioned by the Almighty, that is, separated from ordinary employments and set apart for the service and worship of God. And how important is the thought that the design of the Sabbath, the design of the Almighty in sanctifying and hallowing a day of Sabbath, was that man, his moral and accountable creature, might be sanctified and dedicated by means of it. That the external consecration of the season ends in the internal consecration of the heart of man to his creator and redeemer. All the designs of the institution terminate here. The Sabbath was made, granted, vouchsafed to man as the principal season when all the means of sanctification should have their effect, when man's immortal nature should be restored to its true elevation, when his spiritual and accountable powers should be especially exercised, when his relation to God, his dependence upon him, his obligations, his gratitude and love, his offerings of praise, his prayers and aspirations for future blessings, should be declared and presented. To rise up to the dignity of the Sabbath and perform any of its duties aright, we must understand what sanctification is, who the great God is to whose service we are to be devoted, what that Creator and Redeemer claims of us, who on this day rose from the dead? What are the terms of that covenant of which he is the mediator and Lord? Even before the fall, man in paradise, as we have seen, needed a Sabbath, a day of religion, and for the like ends, to be a sign between God and him, to be a means of exercising and carrying on that sanctification, the principles and habits of which he already possessed. He was permitted to cease, he was commanded to cease, one day in seven from the gentle toil of dressing the Garden of Eden, that he might devote the time more immediately to his almighty Creator, to his glory, to the meditation on his perfections, and works, to the duties of his holy worship and praise, that thus the sanctification of all his powers to his service might be conformed, confirmed and heightened. How much more, then, must man since the fall need this holy day, both as a sign of the covenant and a means of sanctification? He had now not merely to carry on and strengthen habits of holiness like his first parent, but to acquire them. The covenant as it respects him is not a covenant of creation, but of restoration, not of works, but of grace, not to show his obedience by observing a law to which his will is already conformed, but to obtain redemption by believing in the divine mediator of a new and better covenant. Sanctification as to man since the fall is the recovery of the soul to the lost image of God, the illumination of a darkened understanding, the giving a right direction to the will, the changing of the whole bias and, uh, and course of his affections and conduct, the bringing him back to God, his great end, and the preparing him for the enjoyment of God, his ultimate felicity. And this answers the objection which is sometimes absurdly or ignorantly made that under the gospel every day is a Sabbath. All we do is to be done to the glory of God, a spiritual and perfect dispensation claims all we have and are. And yet in paradise, where man walked before God in his original uprightness, 
he was called on to keep a Sabbath. How idle, then, is the plea now that man is fallen. Those who urge it know little of the nature of true sanctification and of the difficulties under which it is attained in this world of conflict. Even if entire holiness could be reached in this imperfect state, a day of rest would be indispensable for the honour of God's name, for the more immediate duties of public and private devotion, and for the carrying out into full exercise the principles of holiness. But it is folly, it is presumption to talk thus, whilst man in his best attainments is full of defects and errors, full of corrupt tendencies, needs a day of sanctification to remind him of his dangers, to bring him out from these snares of life, to lift his heart more entirely towards heaven. Those who talk of every day being a Sabbath mean in fact that no day should be such. Besides the expression keeping holy as it applies to the ordinary day of the week and as it fixes itself on the day of God has a different force and application. To keep holy the six days of the week means only that we intermingle family and private devotions with our lawful labour and work on those days, that we direct our secular calling to God's glory, that we implore his blessing upon all our occupations. But to keep holy the seventh day is to suspend those occupations, to forbear all our ordinary works, to renounce all our secular business, and to devote all the hours of the day to the immediate care of our souls and the immediate worship of God. We are as much called to work the six days as we are to rest on the seven. This is then the first practical duty of the Lord's Day, to keep ever in view its great end. The sanctification of it begins, as to us, when our dedication to God begins. We hallow the Sabbath when we ourselves are hallowed to God. We awake to the true importance of the institution, when we feel our fallen and sinful state, when we receive the covenant of grace proposed in the Gospel, when we seek to be sanctified, body, soul and spirit, to be the Lord's. A divine life infused into the soul of man, a perception of the nature and excellency of spiritual things, a view of the glory and majesty of the great Redeemer, a reliance upon his death and resurrection, a dependence upon the influence of his Holy Spirit, these bring the Sabbath and the human heart together. The Sabbath is born to man when he is born to God. Then it recalls, revives, strengthens all the principles of sanctification. Then it not only gives him the time and affords him the means and calls him to the duties of sanctification, but it leads him to employ all these to their proper end. And thus the Lord is pleased to sanctify man. Thus the day is a sign between him and us. Thus the final ends of all religion are advanced. And here lies the fundamental defect in so many of our cases. We do not feel the unspeakable importance of holiness. We do not desire sanctification. We stop in the external and official parts of the sabbatical institution. We have lost the due sense of what consecration of heart to God means, and therefore of what we should aim at on the day with which it is connected. Consider then, I entreat you, my brethren, the only manner in which you can enter on the practical duties of the Lord's day aright. Examine your state before God. Have you any desire to be made holy? 
to be pardoned, to be separated from sin, to be dedicated to God? Do you wish really to know the demands which Christianity makes upon you? Do you seek earnestly the way of salvation? Behold then what you want. There is the day when all this is to be learned. There is the covenant of, that, of which that day is a sign. There is the sanctification which all the ordinances and exercises of that day are calculated to produce. Implore then the grace of the Holy Spirit to affect your heart seriously with these truths, and thus will all the other directions we may offer fall into their due place. For sanctification being proposed as the great end of the Sabbath.